Hey folks, continuing on, we're now going to look at uh, how to find the length of curves, also known as uh, arc length. And, uh, you know, I should point out, this is probably, it's one of my favorite derivations, coming up with the uh, uh, formula for arc length of a curve. Um, one reason it's, it's one of my favorite derivations is that it gives us another look, another opportunity uh, to discuss what the integration process is all about. I mean, at its core, integration is about slicing things in, up into smaller pieces and then adding it all up, looking at the limit of a sum. Another reason I like this derivation is we have to, uh, in the derivation, we're going to uh, use a couple of old items that you already know. One is uh, the distance formula uh, you would have learned in, in uh, algebra and the mean value theorem that uh, we saw in calculus one. So uh, let's review those real quick. Make sure you write this down in case you don't remember it. The distance formula states that um, if you have two points in the plane, x sub 1, y sub 1, and x sub 2, y sub 2, the distance between those two points is given by d equals the square root of the quantity x sub 2 minus x sub 1 squared plus the quantity y sub 2 minus y sub 1 squared. And then the mean value theorem that we saw in calculus 1 says if f is a function that is continuous on the closed interval AB and differentiable on the open interval AB, then there must exist at least one number C in the open interval AB such that f prime of C equals f of B minus f of A over B minus A. You may remember this was talking about uh, uh, where, where an instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change, where the slope of a tangent line is equal to the slope of a secant line. So, you know, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, that, that's just our old slope formula. It finds the slope of a line. Um, and we can think of that as being a secant line slope, which gives an average rate of change f prime of c, that gives us tangent line slope, which gives us an instantaneous rate of change. So that's a quick review of uh, the mean value theorem that you would have seen back in calculus one. Uh, before continuing, uh, one new brief, just briefly, it's a new vocabulary term, uh, rectifiable curve. Okay, rectifiable curve, uh, you know, if you hear this in a future class, it's just a fancy way of saying it's a curve that has a finite arc length. In this derivation, I will mention this again, uh, so this is important to remember in the derivation, that a rectifiable curve is continuously differentiable on the closed interval AB and its graph on the closed interval AB is said to be a uh, smooth curve. So to briefly shed some insight on how we're going to uh, go about deriving the arc length formula, um, well, let's quickly head off to the uh, interactive ebook and um, you know see what we can come up with here. So. So here's a, here's some function. Here's a, you know it's graph on some closed interval a b, um, and what we're what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a way to determine the length of the curve. So like I said, this is all about integration. What integration was is all about. Integration is all about slicing it up into smaller pieces, get an approximation, take a limit of a sum. So um, let me go ahead and do an approximation here. And uh, um, notice that there's only three points here. So an, one approximation to the length of the black curve here would be, well, let's get the length of this line segment and the length of this line segment. And let's add them together. That would give us an approximation. You know, let me add in a few more um, uh, uh, values of n. That's going to make the uh, interval a to b. I'm going to split it into smaller subintervals. Hey, notice as we uh, as we get more subintervals, that gives us more line segments. As you can see, we could find the length of each one of those line segments, 
add them together, and that would give us an approximation to the actual arc length, the actual length of the curve. And you see as, as n gets larger and larger, we're going to get a better and better approximation. It's a limit of a sum. So somehow integration is going to be involved here. Um, all right, that's enough looking at the interactive ebook. So let me get that out of here. Um, it's time for us to head off to the chalkboard to continue the process. All right, let's uh, talk more about finding arc length or length of a curve. Um, I've already said this is one of my favorite derivations, and it's because it, it gives me one more time to talk about the whole process of integration. So uh, keep in mind that, that I've already reviewed, and hopefully you wrote this down, the uh, uh, old algebra topic of the distance formula and the mean value theorem. I'm going to need this in my derivation. I gave you a new vocabulary term called a rectifiable curve. That's a fancy way of saying um, it's a curve with a finite arc length. Remember that a rectifiable curve is continuously differentiable on the closed interval AB. That's going to be important in the derivation. We just looked at the interactive ebook. Um, you know, I looked at a graph in there. I, I think it was, you know, figure 6.55. Um, did different values for n. Um, and we saw line segments being uh, uh, sketched in there. And that, that's kind of where I'm going to pick up. To approximate the length of the curve, a function f, from x equals a to x equals b. You know, we started off by doing line segment approximations, and that's what we saw in the interactive ebook. You know, we could find the length of, of that line segment, the length of that line segment, the length of that line segment, and the length of that line segment, and add them all up. That would give us an approximation. Any one of those line segments, the length would be found by using the distance formula. Uh, now, before I go any further, and this is to make my uh, life easier, and yours as well, I'm going to let delta x sub i, I'm going to let that equal x sub i minus x sub i minus 1, and delta y sub i equal y sub i minus y sub i minus 1. I'll show you why I want to do that. Um, so I just said any one of those line segments, any one of the line segments can be found, uh, its length can be found by using the distance formula. So the distance formula, let me write that down, it's the square root of x sub 2 minus x sub 1, that quantity squared, plus y sub 2 minus y sub 1, that quantity squared. So any one of those, uh, I'm not going to connect them with a red line, any one of those uh, line segments could be found by using the distance formula. So now, in general, because I'm saying let's let delta x sub i equal this, and let's let delta y sub i equal that, this is telling us nothing more than the length of a subinterval. That's all it's telling us. So my distance formula, I can think of it, instead of as an x sub 2 minus x sub 1, that's, that's telling me the length of any one of those subintervals. Thanks to this notation, I can think of it as being delta x sub i. Likewise, y sub 2 minus y sub 1. I could think of that as being delta y sub i. It's a little more compact notation, and I kind of like the more compact notation for what we're about to do. So this is the, another way to write the distance formula. It gives us the length of any one of the, the line segments. We just said we're going to find a whole bunch of lengths, add them up to get an approximation. So when I add them up, let me use S for a arc length. The arc length is approximately, so I'm adding up a bunch of uh, line segment lengths here. Well, you know I'm going to bring in a sigma to represent add them up. 
I equals 1 to N, and uh, let me write down the distance formula. All right, so this, this is the distance formula. So the summation means I'm just going to add up a bunch of line segment lengths to approximate the actual length of the curve, the arc length. Okay, I'm going to do something here that's under the radical. So I'm going to go over here below the graph and show you, I mean, I can just write down what it is, but I want to show you, um, you know, really what's happening here. So let me just take what's under the radical. Let me just pull this over here. Under the radical, we have a delta x sub i squared plus delta y sub i squared. I can do some factoring here. It might not seem like natural factoring, but I can do the following factoring. I can factor out a delta x sub i squared. Well, when I factor a delta x sub i squared out of this term, I'm left with a 1. And I can factor a delta x sub i quantity squared out of that term, even though we don't see it, but it would look like this. Delta y sub i squared over delta x sub i squared. I mean, if you go ahead and distribute the delta x sub i quantity squared, you're going to get, you're going to get that. Let me do one more little thing. Let me re use an old rule of exponents and rewrite delta y sub i quantity squared over delta x sub i quantity squared as delta y sub i over delta x sub i, that fraction squared. Okay, so now this, this would be living under the radical. So let me write that down. 1 plus delta y sub i over delta x sub i squared. But since delta x sub i quantity squared would also be under the radical, I can use a property of radicals. The square root of delta x sub i squared. Well, I know in general the square root of delta x sub i quantity squared is absolute value delta x sub i. But here I can just say it's delta x sub i because delta x sub i is the length of a subinterval. It can't be negative. Length is always a positive number. So, like I said, I could have just gone from here and written this down, but I thought I'd show you where it was coming from. Again, the arc length is approximated by this mess here, just, just adding up a bunch of line segment lengths. So how would I get a better approximation? Well, this, this sounds like a very familiar song and dance. You get a better approximation by making the subintervals smaller in length. If you make the subintervals smaller in length, norm is going to zero. If norm's going to zero, n is going to infinity, and I mean, it sounds like the limit of a sum. And as soon as I say limit of a sum, boy, I hope you're all saying limit of a sum, that's a definite integral. Well, we're not quite there yet. We have the limit of a sum. We're not quite to the point of writing a definite integral. So uh, let me, uh, you know, let, let me uh, uh, put this, you know what? Let me call that equation one. And uh, what I'm going to do with this uh, equation one is I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do some erasing here. And I'm just going to bring equation one up to the top of the board. 
I'm still calling it equation one, so I'm just going to rewrite this up here. This limit of a sum. Oh, so close. to a definite integral. Okay, now let me erase this, give us a little bit of uh, uh, space to work. So we've seen how, how the distance formula has been used. And you might be thinking, well, the only thing that we haven't used yet that I've said, uh, that I reviewed and I said would be important is the mean value theorem. Keep in mind, we, we're talking about a rectifiable curve. A rectifiable curve is continuously differentiable. Since it's continuously differentiable, let me abbreviate, continuously differentiable, that implies that the derivative definitely exists. That's what it means to be continuously differentiable. The derivative exists. And not only that, the derivative exists, that prime exists, for all values of x, <laughs> in any one of these subintervals, so the derivative exists for any x in any subinterval. That is in any subinterval x sub i minus 1 to x sub i. That's how I represent, that's how we would represent a subinterval. Now here's where your mean value theorem comes in. You know, thanks to the mean value theorem, so thanks to the mean value theorem, there exists A C sub i, there's a C sub i in this generic subinterval such that F prime of C sub i is equal to F of X sub i minus F of X sub i minus 1 over x sub i minus x sub i minus 1. That's the mean value theorem. That's why we reviewed the mean value theorem. But folks, isn't this right here, x sub i minus x sub i minus 1, isn't that just delta x sub i? It is. And these are, well, these represent y coordinates. So this difference, this change in y coordinates is nothing more than delta y sub i. So really, we have from the mean value theorem, f prime of c sub i equals delta y sub i over delta x sub i. Well, I can take that. I can take that. And I can substitute it back up in here to equation 1. So let me substitute it into equation 1. Let me write, write this down again. delta y sub i over delta x sub i, delta y sub i over delta x sub i. That's just f prime of c sub i. So I'm putting f prime of c sub i in here. And that's squared delta x sub i. And now we have something that should look really, really familiar to us. 
this is the limit of a sum, the definition of the definite integral. I mean, from this, we immediately get the arc length is equal to, this is the definite integral from A to B, the square root of 1 plus F prime of X, that quantity squared, DX. And that's it. That's our formula to find the arc length of a curve on the interval A to B. So let's head back to the slides, kind of formalize this a little bit more, and uh, give you some stuff to write down into your notes. All right, we've just went through the derivation and we came up with uh, our formula to find arc length. So I'm gonna put it into a definition now. Say so, uh, y is f of x, uh, represents a smooth curve on the closed interval a, b, then the arc length of function f between a and b is given by, and there it is, that's what we derived, the integral from a to b square root one plus the quantity f prime of x squared dx. Just for completeness sake, um, you know, if your smooth curve is given by, uh, you know, x equals g of y, so it's a function of y, then the arc length of uh, g between c and d is given by, and it's a similar looking uh, uh, arc length formula. Before we do an example, folks, these problems are rigged so that we can actually do them. They're rigged so we'll be able to come up with an antiderivative and evaluate it using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And you'll see, uh, uh, well, you know, this first example, uh, find the arc length of, I mean, let's look at this function. Y equals 1 tenth X to the fifth plus one over six X cubed on the closed interval one to two. I mean, that function just seems really bizarre looking. But we're going we're gonna to do that. That's part A. And part B, uh, the function is y equals x to the 3 halves, x to the 3 halves minus 1 on the closed interval 0, 4. So get these written down. Uh, I'm going to head off to the chalkboard, and uh, we're going to work through them. All right. Uh, remember what I just said about these problems we're going to do? They're rigged so that we can actually do them. So let's look at this example. Find the arc length of, in part A, y equals 1 tenth x to the fifth plus 1 over 6x cubed on the closed interval 1 to 2. I mean, look at that function. There, it's rigged. Then in part B, y equals x to the 3 halves minus 1 on the closed interval 0 to 4. Part B is going to be a, a lot more friendly than part A. Um, so let's get started here. Arc length formula. Integral a to b square root 1 plus f prime of x, that quantity squared, dx. So the first thing we have to do is get the derivative of our function. So here's our function. The derivative is 1 half x to the fourth. Now let's see, I'd rewrite that as 1 sixth x to the negative third. So that would be negative one-half x to the negative fourth. So that's minus one over two x to the fourth. It's right, folks. So we can do the problem. So we have the derivatives. So here, here's how we find the arc length. It's the integral from one to two, the square root of one plus the derivative I have to, I have to, I'm going to have to go over to the side here and work through this. This is uh, some gory algebra to work through. So let me go over here to the side and uh, you know what, I'm going to erase part, I'm going to erase part B just to give me more room. So first off, Let's do the squaring. 1 half x to the 4th minus 1 over 2x to the 4th. 
times 1 half x to the 4th minus 1 over 2x to the 4th. So let's FOIL that out, and when we FOIL that out, this is going to be a mess, potentially. Uh, that multiplication gives us a 1 fourth x to the 8th. When I do the i part of FOIL, oh, the x to the 4th cancel out, so that's not bad. I'm just left with a minus 1 fourth. When I do the i part of FOIL, again, the x to the 4th cancel out, so I'm left with a minus 1 fourth. Well, that wasn't too bad, actually. And we do the L part of FOIL, we get a 1 over 4x to the 8th. So combine those like terms. That gives us a 1 fourth x to the 8th minus 1 half plus a 1 over 4x to the 8th. So that's what we get when we FOIL this out. But now keep in mind, we have to take that, and now we have to add 1. So I have to remember to add 1. Well, that's not bad. Negative 1 half plus 1 gives us this mess. God, I've got to try to factor that. I'm going to try to factor it. And I should be able to factor it. Remember, these problems are rigged. Look, when I foiled, when I did the 1 half x to the 4th minus 1 over 2x to the 4th squared, when I foiled it out, it gave me this. And then when I added 1, the negative 1 half became a positive 1 half. So I'm, I'm just kind of using the work I already did, and I'm saying, I think this factors to 1 half x to the 4th plus 1 over 2x to the 4th times 1 half x to the 4th plus 1, <coughs> 1 over 2x to the 4th. Check it and see. If you distribute here, or if you, if you do the f part of FOIL, you do get a 1 fourth x to the 8th. Here you would just get a 1 half. I'm sorry, you'd get a 1 fourth. Here you would just get a 1 fourth. 1 fourth plus 1 fourth is 1 half. The L part of FOIL would give you a 1 over 4x to the 8. That is the correct factorization, which I can write like this. So I have the integral from 1 to 2. So we just did a lot of gory algebra to determine that 1 plus this quantity squared ends up being a 1 half x to the 4th plus a 1 over 2x to the 4th quantity squared dx. Which, the square root of this mess squared, now technically I know it has to be an absolute value, but I don't worry about the absolute value. I, I know it has to be a positive number. We are talking about an arc length. This is an arc length problem. It's an arc length application. Arc length, the length of a curve. It's a rectifiable curve. It has a finite length. It's, and length of something is a positive number. Well, now it's a matter of just, uh, keep in mind again, problems rigged so we could do it. It was rigged so that when we uh, squared this and added 1, it factored perfectly to a perfect square. So we got to this. So now we can do the integration. And when you do the integration here, you're going to get uh, a 1 tenth x to the fifth. The antiderivative for this is uh, 1 over a 6x cubed. And you evaluate it from 1 to 2. And when I use my calculator and I evaluate that from 1 to 2, I get 779 over 240. The problems are rigged, so we can do them. So that was part A. Now, I told you part B wasn't as bad as part A. Um, and remember, I erased part B. But you should have part B written in your notes. So since you have part B written in your notes, here's what I'd like you to do. 
I'd like you to pause the video. I would like you to do part B. And after you've done part B, restart the video. I'll be here at the board to work through it to make sure you have it correct. It's not as bad as part A. Uh, I see how you did here on part B. Part B, you were asked to find the arc length of y equals x to the 3 halves minus 1 on the closed interval 0 to 4. So uh, let me write down the formula, find arc length, integrate from a to b, the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. Uh, we start by getting the derivative. So the derivative is 3 halves x to the 1 half. So when I substitute that in, I get uh, it's the integral 0 to 4, the square root of 1 plus 3 halves x to the 1 half squared dx. Already I can see this is a lot nicer than what part A was. Let me pull it up here, integrate 0 to 4. This isn't bad at all. When you take 3 halves x to the 1 half and square it, well, 3 halves squared is 9 fourths. x to the 1 half squared is just x. So we have uh, 1 plus 9 fourths x dx. And I can, gosh, I can integrate that pretty easily. It's just a basic u substitution. I let u equal 1 plus 9 fourths x du is a 9 fourths dx, or 4 ninths du is dx. So I substitute in, I get 4 ninths the integral square root u du, you know, which is uh, 4 ninths the integral u to the 1 half du. Uh, so antiderivative, let's see, uh, add 1 to the exponent, reciprocal of the new exponent, uh, this is 8 27 resubstitute, bring back the original limits of integration, use the fundamental theorem of calculus, so let's see a 4 comes in here for x, so 9 fourths, 9 fourths times 4, well 9 fourths times 4 is 9, 9 plus 1 is 10, and when 0 comes in for x, uh, we're just left with a, well, 1 to the 3 halves, 1 to the 3 halves is 1. So, uh, yeah, this is good. Some of you might say, well, I'm going to factor out an 8 27ths to get that, it doesn't matter. This is good or this is good. That's the exact value of the arc length. That's the exact arc length. So hopefully you got part B. Keep in mind, uh, keep in mind folks, these problems are rigged so that you can do them. I don't have many for you to do in this section. So uh, that's it, that's it for the section. Uh, you can now go ahead and do the section, do the few exercises I've asked you to do. Thanks for watching.